So, video number four, I think it is, on software for PS5 and the next gen. I've just shown some features of building geometry and putting points on the structure of interest. I'm actually, for this blade, going to just quickly capture a few manual points uh, rather than use the polygons or automatic functionalities because I want to put the laser beam on these markers that have already been put on the blade, the retroreflective markers which allow us to get lots of light back in the instrument. So rather than using the um, APS standard I'll just switch to building points generally and, and kind of going back to where we were before. So I'll put a point at this laser position, that's going to become point one. I can use the middle, middle mouse button, scan the laser beam to another point, put a point at the laser beam position, um, scan to another point. I don't actually have to click on the point to make it at that laser beam position, but uh, I need to be I need to be actually on a on a good location where I get good optical signal, so I can right click anywhere and put a point on the laser beam position. Um, I just need a few points, hopefully, that are going to give me some kind of meaningful animation after I've collected measurements at these various points. So, bear with me. Okay, so we've got six points. It's not a huge number of points, but it's enough. And we can then use the Generate Triangles button or the connect points button to connect those various thing, points together so that we have a um, like a, a, a wireframe grid. So if I select them all, then you can see that now they're connected with lines. And obviously the more points I have, I'm, I'm going to have a mesh that resembles the surface of the blade on those points. Next stage is to go to the AD settings, A to D settings, and define some properties in here. So I'm doing uh, a frequency based, frequency domain based measurement. I'm going to do probably three averages, which isn't very many, but for impact testing, uh, the number of points we have multiplied by the number of averages is the number of impacts we're going to have to do with the hammer. So we need to try to minimize that. Um, otherwise, we'll be here all day. We can set up the channels so the vibrometry is already defined in the z direction. The reference is going to be the impact hammer. Um, we can define the units for this, which would be newtons or force for the hammer, and you'll see that um, the, the, the sensitivity can be defined. So it's, I think, a 22.2 millinewton per. Um, well, let's have a look in the. Uh, we, don't, we don't have the. We don't have the documentation for the hammer, but we can define the sensitivity for the hammer and we can, we can do that later. It doesn't matter too much because these are relative scalings that we're, we're working with. Importantly though we need to turn on the IEPE conditioning for that channel so then when we connect the hammer it gets power which, which powers the uh, electronics, the signal conditioning electronics within the force transducer and we can connect the hammer into this long BNC cable We've got an extension on there which we can remove, we don't need it. And we can connect into reference number one on the, on the junction box for the H um, system. You can see I've got eight references available in here. So I could have multiple references. I could drive two shakers simultaneously or three shakers if I wanted to do what they call MIMO testing. Multiple input, multiple output. Um, but in this case I just want one reference for the hammer. I can choose to define some filters, low pass, high pass, band pass filters. We typically try not to use filters. We are interested in all frequency content, but sometimes you might want to implement some filters. I can define the acquisition bandwidth. I mentioned earlier for blades like this, you know, we're probably only interested in the first couple of three, four natural frequencies and one kilohertz should be more than enough. Um, the number of spectral lines will define the resolution in the spectrum. Uh, the, the point, the frequencies are reasonably well separated, probably. Um, if we've got two modes, if we've got a symmetrical structure with two modes very close together, we might want fine spectral resolution, and therefore we might need to acquire or have a large number of uh, spectral lines within the spectrum, and that will mean that we have a long sample time over which we measure. 
So you'll see that as I increase the spectral lines, I actually increase the sample time. Um, we're doing impact tests, so we want to capture the, the transient response every time I do a, a strike with a hammer and see that decay occur. If we were interested in getting very fine measurement in time domain, we could do a time-based measurement and set things up similarly um, and we could use, for example, a very fast sample frequency in here which could be up to, as I said earlier, even you know, 250 kilohertz, 200, 250 kilohertz upper limit, um, 2.5 megahertz or so actually this is 250 kilohertz so that's very, very high, uh, even in the H mode. But we're doing frequency-based measurement. Um, I want you know, one kilohertz bandwidth, which means I'm sampling at two and a half and then using an anti-aliasing filter to, at the Nichrosterm to give me a, a one kilohertz alias free bandwidth. I can choose some windowing maybe, so if I'm using, for example, a random excitation, I might choose to use a hand window. They call it a Hanning window in here. Um, sometimes with responses from impacts, we could use an exponential window on the response and a force window on the excitation and we can define parameters to essentially minimize any vibration or signal that's occurring at the end of the acquisition window and therefore minimize leakage. This is standard um, sampling theory stuff but for the sake of simplicity um, and if we set up a good measurement campaign and strategy we can just use a rectangular window i.e. we measure everything within the duration of the you know, 3.2 second duration. Triggering is important. I talked about the reference channels. I talked about sync and, um, and trigger in on the junction box. So I can internally trigger or I can externally trigger or I can use a TTL signal. So I've got multiple options or I can just measure in free running. Um, I'll choose to use an analog reference which is the impact hammer. I'll choose to start measuring when I have 5% of the level on that channel is overcome. So that's going to indicate the start of the impact event. And I want to not miss the very front of that, so I'm going to have a pre-trigger that's around 5% of the total sample time, so 160 milliseconds of pre-trigger. So that means when the, when the threshold is overcome with the triggering level, I don't miss that bit at the front, because that bit at the start, before the trigger level is overcome, is still important to me. Uh, in terms of the calculation. There are some options for speckle tracking. Um, we can define the velocity level, so we can probably start with say 500 millimeters per second range or 200 millimeters per second and see how much, um, when I strike this, the, the, the structure, how much, uh, measure, how much um, level I get on the vibrometer. We've also got the generator. I showed the generator uh, outputs. There are four for this setup. Uh, if we were using a shaker with an amplifier, we'd perhaps define a sinusoidal excitation or a burst random excitation, periodic chirp, maybe just white noise with a hand window, and we can set the voltage. Please keep the voltage level low. This will output up to 10 volts with an offset if necessary, a DC offset, but typically we don't include an offset. Please keep it no more than a volt, maybe even half a volt. And when we activate the generator, um, make sure the amplifier is turned fully down and just turn the amplifier up gently. If you turn on high output voltage on the signal generator with the amplifier again already cranked fully up and you've got a small shaker attached, you can burn out the shaker. And we've done that previously, unfortunately, through misuse and people not necessarily being properly instructed on how to use it. Sometimes things happen, we need to try to avoid burning shakers and that's how we will do that by keeping this low, making sure the amplifier gain is turned down and then when this is running we turn the amplifier gain up slowly and we won't damage the shaker and we can find out how much excitation we get with our shaker. We're doing a hammer measurement today, we don't need the generator output, so I'm turning that off.